a massive war of epic proportions. A conflict involving countless kingdoms that has changed the face of history forever. A clash between ideologies that still continues today. Hello, my Nakamotachi, this is Joy Girl. And with every lore reveal we've received in the Egghead Island arc, I feel like my understanding and perception of the history of One Piece changes. And I think we're getting so, so close to really figuring all of this out and everything just coming together. But we're just missing, ironically, one piece of the puzzle. So let me start by telling you where I'm at in terms of unearthing the truth behind Joy Boy, the Ancient Kingdom, and the Void Century. And I want to start off with the rising sea levels. According to Vegapunk, the world sank by 200 meters as an aftermath of the Great War of the Void Century. And I'm sure you agree with me that that's huge news, and for a number of reasons. Firstly, it ties in quite nicely with other lore and mysteries we've known for some time now. For example, the Red Line, and the world government or Celestial Dragon's actions of taking over the Lunarian's home. It makes sense that after defeating Joy Boy and the Ancient King, Kingdom, the newly formed world government chose the Red Line as their base for Marijuana because they needed to escape the rising sea levels. And what better place than that massive red landmass? But also, this reveal put into perspective just how great the Void Century War was. If we consider that the recent wipeout of Lulucia resulted in the rise in sea level of just one meter, an environmental change that had disastrous consequences for neighboring islands, a rise of 200 meters is just unbelievable. One meter versus 200. I think there was quite a poignant line in chapter 1115 when someone made the comment that a 200 meter rise in sea level would have resulted in the death of a lot of people. And that's a sobering thought. And it also really forces you to think about the ancient kingdom and ancient weapons differently. Up to this point, I've always associated the ancient weapons with the ancient kingdom. As in, I've always assumed that the ancient weapons were used by the ancient kingdom during the Void Century, and I think it's fair to have thought about it that way. We know that there's a relationship between Joy Boy of the ancient kingdom and the former Poseidon, because Joy Boy made a promise to Poseidon to take the Fishman Island inhabitants to land, a promise he failed to keep. Given that Pluton is being hidden underneath Wano, Wano being an ally of Joy Boys, and even the blueprints being something that the world government was after and hunting, this suggested that the ancient battleship was also in the ancient kingdom's possession, rather than being in the possession of the 20 kingdoms. And as for Uranus, it's been suggested that the mother flame created by Vegapunk was modeled after the energy source possessed by the ancient kingdom. And given Vegapunk's recent comments that the recent one meter rise in sea level being due to the use of the mother flame by Imu is similar to the 200 meter increase in sea levels of the past being the result of the ancient weapons. So it seems like mother flame might be based on Uranus. And seeing as the world government needed a replica a la Vegapunk, it suggests that they don't possess Uranus either. So again, I think it was fair to assume that the ancient weapons were possessed and used by the Ancient Kingdom. But then I've really struggled with what this then says about the Ancient Kingdom. Is the Ancient Kingdom really responsible for causing a disaster as great as sinking the entire world underwater? Again, think Lulucia times 200. And if the Ancient Kingdom had possession of all three ancient weapons, how did Joy Boy lose to the 20 kingdoms, which we know to have been far less technologically superior than the ancient kingdom. And we will come back to these questions, but we also have to address the fact that as surprising as it was to find out about the world sinking underwater, it's also not the first time we've come across this idea. Because we also found out at the end of the Wano arc that a historical Wano kingdom exists below the sea. But a difference between the situation at Wano and the rest of the world is that Wano's kingdom came to be submerged underwater because of its own actions. For some reason, 
reason, reasons unknown to Sukiyaki, the people of Wano built walls around its kingdom, which resulted in rainwater pooling into Wano until people had to move higher up to Mount Fuji to escape the rising sea levels. Now that we know that the rest of the world would face a similar threat, for me, it seems like Wano built walls around its kingdom to actually protect itself from the massive floods that it knew would come as a result of the war and the use of the ancient weapons. And this is interesting because then it seems like there's a pattern here. Road poneglyphs, or at least most of the road poneglyphs, are located on islands where the war-induced flooding would not be a problem. Wano protected itself with walls and took preventative measures to store the road poneglyph where it wouldn't be lost by floods. The road poneglyph, which was previously located at Fishman Island, was located deep underwater, which would have already been unaffected by the flooding that is going on up above. Whereas the road poneglyph above Zo is safe because Zo is located on top of Zunisha, the mystical elephant being a gigantic creature tall enough to survive a 200 meter rise in sea levels. Unfortunately, we don't know where Big Mum found the road poneglyph that's in her possession, so I don't know if this theory checks out 100%. But for now, it seems like all the kingdoms that were chosen to house the road poneglyphs were sufficiently prepared to survive the massive ecological shift that would result from the use of the ancient weapons. And this is interesting because this seems to increase the ancient kingdom's responsibility for causing this sort of massive consequences for the world. It's as if the ancient kingdom warned all of its own friends and allies about the impending rising sea levels. In which case, I'm sure you guys would have to agree with me that that doesn't shine a very favorable light on the ancient kingdom. In fact, they seem quite evil. But by now, I'm sure that many of you are screaming at your screens, yelling at me. But remember, Vegapunk also said that he can't judge who was right or wrong. In fact, he said this twice now. When it comes to the Great War of the Void Century, it's not up to him to claim one side was just and the other one evil. Now, I've dedicated a whole video to this very recently, and I do shamelessly, but also very seriously recommend you to go check that video out, because I think a lot of the speculations and connections I made in that video are valid. And while we're taking a break, please take this time to like this video and also subscribe to help out the channel. I'd really appreciate your support. But now, back to the video. To be fair, Vegapunk making these comments about the moral ambiguity of both sides of the conflict could just come down to the fact that he doesn't have all the information, which is something he did admit due to him only working with fragments of the real history. But I think there is some truth to this statement, otherwise Oda wouldn't go to this extent of having Vegapunk emphasize this point more than once. We have also seen throughout the series that morality is grey, not so clear cut, and it's also a sentiment that Rayleigh has similarly shared in the past. So then cumulatively, Oda has now implied that the the war between the 20 kingdoms against the ancient kingdom is a lot more complex than simply ancient kingdom good, 20 kingdoms bad. And this would make a lot of sense if the ancient kingdom is the one that used the weapons of mass destruction that caused the world to sink. The ancient kingdom doesn't seem so pure or good if they're the ones causing the destruction of entire continents and kingdoms. But here comes the next curious detail, another piece of interesting dialogue. Something I found particularly interesting in chapter 1115 was Vegapunk's use of some very choice language. When he references Joy Boy's side of the war against the 20 kingdoms, he doesn't simply just call them the Ancient Kingdom or the Great Kingdom. Instead, Vegapunk expressly calls it Joy Boy's faction. That's a very specific way to put it. Now, there are a few ways I could try interpret this. One, he doesn't simply refer to the Ancient Kingdom because that's not the real name of the kingdom and part of his great announcement to the world is to expose the real name of the ancient kingdom. Two, it wasn't only the ancient kingdom that was involved in the war against the 20 allied kingdoms, so he's trying to be more accurate. Or three, this one being the reason I'm leaning towards the most, because it wasn't the entirety of the ancient kingdom that Joy Boy represented. Faction is the most accurate way to describe the group that Joy Boy led in the fight against the 20 kingdom, 
Romans because it was only a faction within the ancient kingdom that he represented. And if this third reason is correct, and I am going to give you more supporting evidence or clues as to how or why it might be correct, then this starts to explain all the other curious and at times seemingly conflicting pieces of information we have about the void century. Remember what we said about coming back to those questions? Yes, the ancient kingdom may have caused the world to sink, but this may not mean all of them were evil. And if factions within the ancient kingdom were fighting amongst each other, it would explain why the 20 kingdoms or how the 20 kingdoms could defeat the ancient kingdom despite the overwhelming gap in power. I think the ancient kingdom not being one homogenous kingdom makes sense, especially based on our knowledge of the D clan. We've long known the D clan to be the enemy of the celestial dragons, so it's easy or fair to assume that the D clan also refers to the ancient kingdom, which up to this point, the ancient kingdom or the great kingdom has been the blanket term used to also describe the opposing side of the 20 kingdoms in the great war. But in the same way that the D clan are not a homogenous group, the clearest example being Blackbeard being the opposite to Luffy, we can assume that the ancient kingdom was also made up of differing types of individuals, which is to say that Joy Boy represented a faction within the ancient kingdom. And I have gone through all of this in much greater detail in my recent video, but based on the new information of chapter 1115, I'm also going to guess that these opposing factions created a civil war within the ancient kingdom. And this is what created the perfect opportunity for the allied 20 kingdoms to wage war on this advanced kingdom during a period of internal chaos. We know that it was the ancient kingdom that was technologically advanced and far superior to the rest of the world. This would naturally lend itself to mean then that the ancient kingdom may have been a great threat. They may have held more power or influence in the world and the other kingdoms would have been jealous, always living in fear or at least apprehension even if the ancient kingdom wasn't overtly aggressive or hostile. So then when infighting began between the two factions, the other kingdoms seized their opportunity to try and topple the ancient kingdom altogether. And what a timely opportunity to do so, especially if this civil unrest was resulting in global harm because of the advanced technology the two sides of the ancient kingdom were using against each other. In another video of mine, which I again shamelessly plug, I put forward that the history of the One Piece universe is quite uncanny to the history of our real world. And in particular, the ancient kingdom especially mirrors ancient Rome. And now I won't repeat all of the historical connections here, but based on this new information about factions, I do think it's interesting that one of the major contributors to the downfall of the great ancient Roman civilization was due to civil war and internal political unrest that made it easy for neighboring kingdoms and tribes to pick apart the great kingdom, resulting in the Dark Ages. And I think that's similar to what could have happened to the ancient kingdom in the Void Century. This also lines up with the notion that has been repeated by Vegapunk and suggested by Rayleigh all those chapters ago. It's not so easy to declare who was right or wrong because the ancient kingdom was not one entity. And in the 20 kingdoms opposition to the ancient kingdom, the 20 kingdoms were fighting the good alongside the bad. The 20 kingdoms may have also been doing something that was seen as necessary, i.e. not purely evil, because their opposition to the ancient kingdom could be justified by the fact that no kingdom with weapons as advanced as the ancient weapons should be allowed to exist because of the massive consequences it was imparting worldwide. And this seems like this may have been hinted earlier in the series, actually way before and on more than one occasion. In chapter 626, we find out that Poseidon has the ability to be able to sink the entire world into the ocean if her powers are used maliciously. While the power of love can save lives, she needs someone to guide her in the right way. And as the Sea Kings act in accordance with her psychological state, sometimes it's not even a conscious use of her ability. She may not intend to cause harm, but her panic and distress may cause the Sea Kings to act rashly, inadvertently causing trouble. And it seems like this is something that may have happened in the past, because in chapter 968, when we see the Sea Kings discussing their anticipation for the rebirth of their mermaid princess, they also comment that it is almost here, 
better. And surely, this time, it will all go well. This piece of dialogue suggesting that last time, it did not go well. Now maybe that's just the general comment about the overall outcome of the Great War because Joy Boy died, but there is also a chance that they're referring specifically to the use of Poseidon's powers. What if Poseidon of the Void Century times did not master her ability to control the Sea Kings in the same way that Shirahoshi managed to? Maybe her distress at what was happening during the Void Century caused the Sea Kings to run amok, resulting in the Sea Kings drowning some islands, serving as fuel to the Twenty Kingdoms argument that the ancient kingdom with their overpowered abilities should not exist at all, regardless of whether it's being used intentionally for bad. Which is actually quite similar to dialogue used in connection to Pluton. In chapter 344, back when Iceberg thinks Robin is evil and plans to use Pluton, he comments that no matter who is in use of the battleship, just or evil, the use of such mass weapons won't bring about world peace. And then he also goes on to say, the evils of the past should not be reawakened. This last line suggesting that we should not allow history to repeat itself. Pluton should not be used again, no matter who's the one using it. Again suggesting that it may have been the ancient kingdom, the guys assumed to be good, that were in possession and use of the Pluton. And if the ancient weapons were used by the ancient kingdom as part of their internal civil war, causing irreparable harm to the world around them, this would be cause for action for the 20 kingdoms. I think this would be justification enough for the 20 kingdoms to step in and make the claim that the ancient kingdom in its entirety should be destroyed. Maybe Joy Boy's faction within the ancient kingdom thought that even after their use of the ancient weapons, they could still make the world right. And to Ors, the ancient giant being known as the continent puller. It's not clear that all giants were allied to the ancient kingdom or that all believe in the legend of sun god Nika like in Elbaf, but if all giants were allied to the ancient kingdom, then it could make sense that these ancient giants were pulling continents in the aftermath of the war, trying to save people even amidst the sinking of landmass, trying to form new islands for people to live on. But I'm sure this still wasn't enough faced with 200 meter increase in sea water. I know that Oz is said to have been evil, but this could be another lie spun by the world government because they didn't want to admit that some people within the ancient kingdom were actually trying to save others. Or maybe the ancient giants were actually allied to the bad guys within the ancient kingdom. In any case, if we accept the civil war, I think this way, the ideological difference that Vegapunk was talking about could have been whether the existence of great power at all should be permitted. Whereas the Joy Boy faction of the Ancient Kingdom would have argued yes, that they could be trusted to use their knowledge, their technology for good, that they should be allowed to exist because they can be trusted. The 20 kingdoms might have argued that their advanced abilities are far too great a threat and should be extinguished altogether. Which seems to fit in line with the public facing principle of the empty throne. After experiencing the ancient kingdom, the 20 kingdoms decided no one ruler, no one kingdom should rule. Although ironically, Imu ended up gaining absolute powers anyways, but initially they may have truly believed, or at least some of the 20 kingdoms may have truly believed that they were creating a better world where there would be no more monopolization of power. And if this was the ideological divide, I can see why Vegapunk may have such a hard time deciding who's right or who's wrong. He's experienced firsthand what either side of the argument means. On one hand, he's all about continuing scientific knowledge and progress. In the end, justifying that despite the risks, we must continue to advance as a humanity and trust everyone to not abuse it. But he's also seeing how such advancement can be abused and understands the gravity of those consequences when those risks become reality. Or another ideological battle that I think could make sense in the circumstances is between freedom versus stability or control. I think the original conflict between the two factions within the ancient kingdom depended on their differing view towards freedom. Whereas the Joy Boy faction sees freedom in the same way Luffy views freedom, having fun, going on adventure, the opposing faction may have interpreted 
interpreted it as the freedom to do anything, regardless of the consequences on others. And in turn, the 20 kingdoms, being the victims of these powers trying to exercise their respective ideals on freedom, decided that no, we need stability. And in order to achieve this, we need control and order, hence the world government. And I'm not gonna lie, both ideological conflicts seems quite similar to the arguments that were made in Captain America Civil War. But I digress. If we write about this being the broader premise of the Great War of the Void Century, the idea that there was a civil war that turned into a global war, I can also see how this might relate to other mysteries we have in the series. For one, Zunisha's crime and punishment. Over the years, I've seen speculations that Zunisha's crime relates to its alliance with Joy Boy, resulting in the world government punishing Zunisha. But I'm not so convinced. Because then the person able to pass down orders should be someone on the world government side, but it's not. It's Momonosuke, a Kazuki descendant whom we know has been a historical ally to Joy Boy. Meaning that Zunisha did a crime that was seen as a wrong to the ancient kingdom, or at least to Joy Boy's faction. So I think Zunisha's crime was to actually activate one of the ancient weapons, or itself acting in aggression, causing further global harm at a time when Joy Boy was trying to prove to the world that not all in the ancient kingdom are evil and malicious and can be trusted to use powers for good. This is why Zunisha isn't allowed to make its own decisions. And it's also why the person able to control Zunisha is someone who isn't a part of the D clan. As penance for Zunisha's mistake and as a way to convince people that the ancient kingdom weren't trying to monopolize power, it's not a person of the ancient kingdom that can control Zunisha. It's someone outside of the ancient kingdom. Someone who doesn't have the same abilities or knowledge of the ancient kingdom. Explaining the voice of all things. Because the voice of all things has always been a great mystery to me because of the fact that it's not all of the D clan that have it and it's not only the D clan members that have it. So it could make sense that the powers needed to be stored outside of solely ancient kingdom citizens as a way to gain trust or as the more politically favorable move. But even aside from Zunisha, going back to the overall idea of there being some sort of civil unrest, I think this is quite important because it also has relevance to the future war of One Piece. As Vegapunk says, the Great War of the Void Century is still ongoing. And he's certainly right when you consider the parties involved in today's conflict. Yes, there's Luffy versus the world government, but there's also Luffy versus Blackbeard, mirroring what happened during the Void Century. And I think this means that what is at Laugh Tale, what is the One Piece, that great treasure that Joy Boy left behind, I think it's something that could be used whether for good or for bad. It's something that could make or break the world war that is still continuing. If someone like Blackbeard gets to it first, it would be catastrophic for the world, undoing all of the work that Joy Boy and his allies did during the Void Century and in the time since, because it's something that a person like Luffy needs to use for good, needs to use for peace in a harmonious way. Something that will convince the world of the argument that Joy Boy's faction was making during the Great War. And Luffy needs to get to it first. Which ties in quite nicely to Whitebeard's comments about Blackbeard, that Blackbeard was not the man that Roger was waiting for. He's not the man that Joy Boy was waiting for. He's not the man that's going to put this world war to an end. Or that's my theory anyways. But like I said, I don't think this theory is complete yet, so please, Add in your thoughts by leaving a comment below. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel because I would really, really appreciate it. You can also help the channel out further by becoming a member. And thank you to all of our current Patreon and channel members for your support. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.